My name is VG. I'm a professor at Tuck. It's a great honor for me to moderate this important and landmark event and share the stage with two extraordinary leaders. The star of the show today is clearly the 19th president of Dartmouth College and the first woman to be elected president of Dartmouth in its entire 254 year history. <laughs> and if I might add, the youngest person to be president of any Ivy League university. <laughs> Dr. Sion Bailot. Let's give Sion another big hand. You know, I was asked to introduce Sion, and do I really need to introduce her? <laughs> By now, if you don't know who Sion is, you're probably living underneath a rock somewhere. <laughs> you know, this inauguration is a three-day event, three-day celebration, and today is the kickoff. And for the kickoff, we wanted to be purposeful and intentional, and choosing the chief guest. And Indra Nui checks all the boxes. Just like Sian, Indra is also the first woman to be elected CEO of a most iconic company in the world, PepsiCo. But the similarities between Sian and Indra goes deeper than that, as you will find out uh, today. There was another motivation we had in inviting Indra. I consider Indra to be my friend, my mentor, and my well-wisher. And our hope was Sian will start building a bond with Indra starting today. Indra would be a terrific mentor for Sian. He'll be good for Sian. He'll be good for Dartmouth. And frankly, it'll be good for the world. Please join me in welcoming Sian, who will welcome in turn Indra Nui. Thank you, Vijay. And it's such an honor to be here tonight. And thank you all so much for coming to kick off my next three-day inauguration festivities. It's really, it's wonderful. I see all the chairs on the green, and I think it's really happening. <laughs> Um, it's so wonderful to have Indra here tonight and a woman whose accomplishments really have redefined corporate America as a leader. Um, and it, would be, it wouldn't be appropriate to speak about leadership tonight without acknowledging a really deep loss in our community last night of our Dartmouth alum and football coach, Buddy Tevens. Um, Buddy would have been first in line to be here, uh, to talk to Indra, to um, hear her leadership lessons, and I know where we all uh, think of him and, and the family tonight. Indra's legacy is under, unwavering. I think we all know that. She's been an exceptional visionary and has had transformative leadership. As the former chairperson and CEO of PepsiCo and the first ever woman in that role, she navigated the complexities of global business uh, with poise, intellect, and profound commitment to her values. I think that's something that really differentiates and, and, and underscores what's so special about Indra. She talks about things also that you'll hear me talk about at Dartmouth, sustainability, diversity, innovation. These are all things that I think are a hallmark of a Dartmouth education and of the community we have here. And we're so excited to have her on campus to kick off inauguration. I've gotten to know her a bit over the last few months, thanks to VJ, who is co-chairing my inauguration committee. And it's just really special to be able to have a fireside chat with her, to share her insights, um, and to learn from her and the community tonight. So I know I'm as eager as you are to hear from Indra, so please join me in welcoming Indra Nui.
both Sian and Indra told me they want to have fun today. <laughs> have an informal conversation about important things. The way we will do it is I'm going to ask both Indra and Sian some questions just to provide some context and then we will have some audience interaction. There are three big themes for inauguration. Leadership, innovation, and impact. So I'm going to frame my questions under those three themes. Let me start with the first big theme, which is leadership. Let me start with a question probably on everyone's mind here. Let's look at facts. 50% of Dartmouth undergrads are women. 50% of tech grads are women. Well, 50% of the world's population, they are women. But when you look at the Fortune 500 list of CEOs, less than 10% are women. So the question naturally is, why is that? And what can we do to change that? And both Sian and Indra, you are great role models because you broke so many barriers mm -hmm. to reach leadership positions. And what I would like for both of you to reflect is how can we, going forward, break down barriers so that more women would achieve leadership positions and realize their full potential? Let me start with you, Indra. You were born and brought up in South India, mm -hmm. which has very strict gender roles. You came into the US when you were 23 years mm -hmm. and rose up to become CEO of PepsiCo. You are truly a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. And I want you to reflect on your career arc and share with us what barriers do we need to break down so that more women assume leadership roles. And would it not be wonderful if we take a look at the list of Fortune 500 companies one day and find 100% of the CEOs are women? <laughs> so the question is, how do we create millions and millions of Indra Nui's? Do you really want to know the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say educate the men. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, I mean, I say it in a tongue-in-cheek way and a genuine way because Men hold most of the seats of power. And if the people who are holding the seats of power hold the talented behind, you can't do much. And uh, I think if you really want the best talent to rise to the top, you've got to have everybody say, I'm going to evaluate talent for talent's sake, not look at the gender and background and ethnicity. And I think the group that has to really accept the fact that life may not be the same uh, boys club that it used to be are the men. So the question is, I'm going to throw it back at you. How do we educate the men? <laughs> uh, I'm here only to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, uh, but, but, but tell me, Indra, are, are there men in your career that, who really helped you along? All my life. Because there were no women at all when I was uh, working. When I first came to corporate America and then rose, I had no women, woman peers. I had no woman bosses hardly any women around me. And all my best experiences were with men bosses and men peers who went out of their way to mentor me, pull me up, um, kick me when I did things wrong in a nice way. But I am a product of fantastic mentorship by all those men. But they were all enlightened, educated men. And when time came to pick a CEO for PepsiCo, um, my predecessor, Steve Reinemann, felt strongly about um, the fact that I should be the CEO, and the board felt strongly about it too. So, and there were largely men on the board too. So I'd say I was surrounded by enlightened men, but we need more of them. I and sincerely mean this. We need more yeah. educated, enlightened men about the power of talent. And if they focus on power of talent as opposed to the power of male talent with some women thrown in to appease the critics, Life would be very different. <laughs> and, and, and tell me, Indra, uh, Roger Enrico is another person who yeah. has had a huge influence on you. Mm -hmm. 
and your husband, Raj. Of course, and, in and, a different and, way, yeah. In different ways. Tell me about <laughs> Roger Enricos. And, and he's, I know he came before Steve, and I think he yeah. was probably the one who really saw your potential and gave the opportunity. Well, the person that made all the difference was actually a German guy called Gerhard Schulmeier, who I worked with for six years in Motorola and ABP. And Gerhard was my boss and a very difficult boss. I mean, very German. Um, in fact, even when he spoke English, uh, it was like a German version of English. <laughs> but I enjoyed working with him because he made me believe that I could do more than I was cap that I thought I could do. He put me into forums that were very uncomfortable because they were way above my pay grade, but he said, you can do it. Uh, pushed me into those. Uh, he was teaching at MIT at the business school, and he'd make it a point to say he's not available just to send me to teach his class. So he built me up in ways that were profound. And but for Gerhard, I would not have come to PepsiCo and risen as fast because Gerhard, I think, jump shifted my career by about 10 years, my trajectory by 10 years. So, you know, you wouldn't expect that a German male would be such a fantastic mentor, but here is a guy who only looked at talent for talent's sake. He didn't care if you're male or female. If you did a good job, he elevated. If you didn't do a good job, you were out right away. You need more people like that. Fantastic. All the men in the room, you've got a challenge now. She's you know what's it. interesting? Uh, the way you should look at this is to say, if you have a daughter, how would you like your daughter to be viewed in the workplace? If you'd, and I'm going to say this honestly. If one of my daughters came home and told my husband, you know, I was in the workplace today, I made a great presentation, but they talked over me and they sort of cut me off, my husband's immediate reaction is, I'm coming there to punch him out. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Every father should feel that way because your daughter is as valuable as your son. But don't forget that when you come to the workplace yourself, if you did that to some other women, it's somebody else's daughter or wife or, or, or niece or, ne or uh, a cousin or whatever. Somehow we forget that. So I think we've got to think of each of these employees as if they were our daughter or our relative, how would we deal with them? and we have to deal with them that way. You know, it's so interesting you mentioned that because there's great psychology research showing that dads and their perceptions of whether their daughter can succeed is oftentimes more important than the mom's perception. The Absolutely. dad really is a dictator of whether a, a woman will break barriers. And it's true in the workplace as well. If you look at who's been most successful as mentors, men, male mentoring females, often it's dads of girls. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I was in Nashville this morning, and one of the moderators there said he has five boys and four girls. And he wanted to have a chat with me because he said the boys are all confident, but the four girls lack confidence. What do I do? So I said, let me ask you a question. When have you told them they can be anything they want to be and that they're brilliant and they're smart? And he said, no, never. Why, <laughs> well, why not? Have you told the yeah. boys that? Said, yeah, you know, we do boys things. But why can't you tell your girls that yeah. they're smart, they can do whatever? He said, never occurred to me. I said, have you ever sh you know, given them a good handshake and seen if they gave you eye contact? He said, no but they give me wimpy handshakes. I said, have you ever taught them how to give a good handshake? He said, no. I said, the problem starts with you. Go back, <laughs> fix this, I will talk again. Because I think, you know, the dynamics of the family are very important, exactly as you said. If the father said that to the daughters, it will give them additional tailwinds to be yeah. even better and have more confidence. Yeah, it really matters. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe you, you can add something, Sion, to what Indra was saying, because you look back, Dartmouth, after 254 20, years, we got it right and have a woman <laughs> as, as, as the president. And tell me, from your standpoint, is, are there things that you want to add to what Indra was saying in terms of how we give more opportunities for women to yeah. realize their full potential? I mean, I love what Indra said about men being really important role models and mentors for women. It's not just about women uplifting women, it's about men, and that's certainly true for me. Uh, Bob Zimmer, who was the president of University of Chicago, picked me out of the faculty, and that's how I got into administration. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Um, I also think another way to address this is to think about 
the entry points. We know that when there are multiple entry points, that's when more women come to the table. I think our Dean of Engineering is here. Engi our Dartmouth Engineering is such a great example. It was the first engineering school in the country to have uh, par gender parity at the undergrad mm -hmm. level. And although I don't have causal data, I'm convinced it's because there were different ways to get into the engineering curriculum. Because at Dartmouth, you do a B BA as you're going to do the BE. And it wasn't just through a weed out class. You could come in through design thinking or other forms, and that is so important. Um, and when, even if someone hasn't had those experiences, a woman hasn't had those experiences at home or in the family, if you make it so there's different ways she can get into the system, different ways she can get into leadership, different ways she can decide she's interested in math and science, it gives more opportunities to, to be successful. Yeah. Terrific. Sion, let me ask you a question. I'm always fascinated when you become a leader, it is some experience in your early part of your life that strengthens your desire to become a leader. <laughs> and can you share with us, Sion, are there some experiences that shape your thinking saying, I want to be a leader? Yeah, I mean, I, I tell this story often, but it's really true. When I was in um, third grade, I wanted to play soccer with my friends who are all boys and I wasn't allowed to play on the boys team. And we were signing up in the gym and I remember my mom, who's a lawyer, went up and said, what do you mean she can't play on the boys team? Of course, what rules are there in place? And I got to play with the boys and I realized that not all rules have to, to be abided by. That if you have a value, that if you think something can change, if you make a good argument in case, then you can change the situation. And I, I remember that because I was so resigned to the fact that I wasn't gonna get to play soccer with my friends. And I watched someone make this really passionate and good argument, and I thought, wow, like you can actually change things and systems. And, and that was really, that was probably the first idea I had that if you make a really good argument, you can get somewhere. And then I grew up with parents of lawyers, so um, we actually have copies of some of the memos that I wrote to them about Ooh. things I wanted, and um, <laughs> and the memos they wrote to me when I got grounded. <laughs> uh, but I realized that you could advocate and um, and and affect change, and that was powerful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Indra, what, what shaped your Thinking. What experience in your life shaped your thinking that you want to be a leader? You know, I always say that I won the lottery of life being born into a family where they believed that the girls and the boys had equal status. So we were never held back because of our gender. Um, I was also a middle child, which, you know, middle child always seeking attention, right? So my sister was like the uh, special child of the family and my kid brother was like the darling of the family and there I'm, help me, help me, please. So I did everything that was breaking the mold. Um, I played cricket for the women's cricket team at a time when women never played cricket. I formed a women's cricket team and said we're going to play. I played in a rock band. <laughs> and um, I mean, don't ask, it was terrible rock band, but it was a rock band, hey, what the hell. <laughs> uh, I did that. Uh, everything that women shouldn't do, I did. And my parents never stopped us. They had some checks and balances, couldn't be out late, Our practices had to be at home. Mom and dad would come to every concert and sit in the first row so that when the lights hit them, you don't see anybody else except your mom and dad <laughs> staring at you. That's okay, you know, at least they let me play in that band. So I think that I was lucky for those parents. And therefore, I never felt discriminated because of my gender at any point in time, at any point in time. So I grew up confident. Um, my grandfather forced me into, not forced me, suggested I do a lot of debating. So when you go for debating competitions, you develop confidence, a lot of confidence. And all of that sort of gave me a solid foundation to feel comfortable about myself. And then after that, you know, little by little, you could tolerate the, uh, the bad things that happened to you later on because you had the solid foundation uh, that gave you confidence. Interesting. And I also always think leaders build success mm -hmm. with one failure at a time. And Indra, can I ask you, can you reflect on a memorable failure mm -hmm. and what you learned and how it helped you to become a better leader? Lots of failures. I think the great thing is you can look at failures as, as one of two things. One, you can say, oh my God, I've failed or I've had a big problem and sort of get down about it and then um, just 
mope for a while, <laughs> and many people do that. The other thing to do is to say, yes, I need some grieving time, but not too much. But go back and relive the failure. and Look at everything you did that caused the failure and use it as a learning moment. And then make sure those things don't happen again. Very few do that because you're looking to see who to blame for the failure as opposed to, let me just take ownership for the problem and figure out how I can make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I've had many failures in my life, let me t uh, show you. But that made me a better person. Um, I'll give you one which was very public. Um, that was Pepsi Refresh. I don't know if any of you know Pepsi Refresh. Some of you know. <laughs> don't date yourself, please. Uh, <laughs> but way back in 2008 when we had the big financial crisis, um, a lot of people were hurting. And in many communities, uh, community programs were all withdrawn, funding for that. Uh, things like uh, you know, baseball in the community or cheerleading, all of this was stopped. So we'd get letters saying, Pepsi, can you fund this program? Now I'm talking about $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. So we decided, the Pepsi guys came to me with an idea and they said, we spend millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in the Super Bowl. Let's take a bit of that money and put it in a fund and let's crowdsource ideas to support community projects. After all, the whole country is in trouble and let people vote on the best ideas and we'll give out small grants every two or three weeks. So it was called the Pepsi Refresh Project, a new look at Pepsi. Uh, we had an independent board and I think the first week we must have gotten a thousand submissions. We picked about 10, but the prizes were $500 to $5,000. You know, these are small bucks relative to what we were doing. I remember giving out the first check to a group of children who have Down syndrome who wanted to be cheerleaders. And nobody would, they didn't have the money to pay for somebody to teach them how to cheerlead. Uh, one guy stepped up but had to pay, get paid a few thousand bucks to take them through the program. That was the first check. It was just a great feeling to give it up. And there were people in the company that loved it until a professor from a certain business school wrote a scathing, scathing report saying that, um, this is do good, do gooder mentality that's going to destroy the business, and this is the wrong way to support a brand, even though the whole country was in trouble. And my damn luck at that point, Pepsi lost a tenth of a market share. A tenth, I want to tell you. And the tenth was because McDonald's had just recovered from bad performance, and because the red beverage is poured in McDonald's. They got the, uh, the benefit of the uh, growth of McDonald's because they're a sole source in McDonald's. So I lost a tenth of market share. Tenth of a market share, you can get it back. But the criticism was way too much on the outside. And uh, I withdrew Pepsi Refresh. Publicly accepted failure and withdrew Pepsi Refresh. So something that was so close to my values, something that everybody in the company loved because of an academic, I'm sorry, Viji, who had never been in a company, who never run anything, doesn't know how business works, doesn't know anything, <laughs> okay? I'm sorry, there are those two, okay? <laughs> writes, a, writes a case about it, and now, you know, the media picks it up because it's sensational, and I'm like, she's got to go kind of articles. I said, shit, let me just withdraw it. I withdrew it, and I lost face inside the company because he said, if this company goes, this program goes to you know, the soul of who we are. Why did you withdraw PepsiCo from that? But I had to be sensible at that time. I was a new CEO and I didn't want um, too much uh, negative publicity on PepsiCo. So I withdrew that program. I regret it even today. I regret it even today. This is the right thing to do. If I had to do it all over again, I would have stayed with Pepsi Refresh and taken all the criticism. Are you saying Therefore, the leadership lesson is you should have stuck to your values even though it perhaps was. Well, it's a slightly different leadership lesson. The leadership lesson here is that when you're a new CEO in particular, um, do the right thing for the company, absolutely, what is consistent with your values, but also be pragmatic mm -hmm. about when to change. So flip-flopping is not a bad thing if you do it only occasionally as opposed to all the time. Take a good look at the environment, you know, review the facts, and if you have to change course, do it. 
and don't be so dogmatic that you put the company in trouble. Yeah. And it was a difficult, difficult time, but I did it. But was it the right decision at the time, given you were a new CEO? It, yes and no, you know. Um, I wish I had more courage at that time to stick with it, but I didn't. I was too new, I was only two years into the CEO job. Uh, if I, and the other problem, Sian, is that since I was an immigrant, person of color, woman, running a Fortune 50 company, the media told me, we're gonna build you up so we can take you down, all right? So everybody was focused on, when was I gonna make a misstep? I didn't want this to be the misstep. So I withdrew from that program. I love what you talk about, about going over your failure and thinking about what you could do differently, and that's something that we talk about in, in, in cognitive science, yeah. about actually cognitively reframing and thinking about the failure, and it's a way to sort of think about not just dwelling on what went wrong, but what you might change differently in the future, and you go from this situation where you're just focusing on the negative aspects to having a sense of control about what you would do differently. Absolutely. And there's a lot of great research showing that when Olympic athletes, for example, do this, when they've choked in the Olympics um, in a swimming race, swimmers, mm. they've studied swimmers and looked at their brains, and they show that when they're looking at their brains and they, they're reliving their failures, all of the negative emotion centers are lighting up. Yeah. But then when you give them some time to think about what they might have done differently, maybe they got off the blocks later, their stroke wasn't solid, and what they're gonna change moving forward, then all of a sudden the negative emotion centers quiet down mm. because they now have control or some perceived sense of control about where they're going. Mm -hmm. So you really can think about how you reframe and what you do differently the next time. And the key is to sort of not sit in the failure for too long without thinking about how you're gonna make a change. There's another lesson I learned, Viji, from that, which is when the uh, professor from that university was writing the case, we knew he was writing the case. Why didn't we reach out and give him more facts? So, yeah. you know, the one hand, it's easy for me to say this professor had never been in a company, but as company is also stonewall academia. We could have easily sort of reached out and said, let's work together to give you all the facts. And, you know, we, are, we have such a lofty sense of self, so we don't cooperate. And then we criticize when the case comes out, like I'm doing now. So <laughs> I want to make sure I want to make sure you understand both sides. We could have easily, uh, re you know, reached out and said, "Let's talk." Yeah, and, and it's interesting, Indram. Probably that's a lesson you took, because I remember many times NGOs really were critical of what you were doing in mm. PepsiCo. You reached out and well, almost were... met with them and, and understood their logic and see what, from their point of view. So maybe it was this refresh that helped you to sort of look at your critiques and proactively uh, work to change their mind with facts and data. You, another dimension it, yes. But the other reason that I always reached out to NGOs is my daughter used to work for the Environmental Defense Fund. And she was one of those uh, well-meaning NGOs that didn't get paid much. You know, NGOs don't get paid much, but work long hours and with great passion. So when uh, Oxfam or somebody else comes to the office to protest something, I was always told, avoid them, you know, take the other route inside the office because you don't want to meet with them. So why not? <laughs> I want to meet with them. I want to know what's on their mind because if you open the lines of communication, maybe I can learn something and they can learn something from what I'm doing. So I'd always sit down and chat with them. It was interesting because you could always change their mind. Now, I have to tell you, NGOs only get funding when they criticize people. If they compliment anybody, they can't get funding. So even if they agree with your point of view, they have to criticize you afterwards. So as long as you understand where both of you stand, that's okay. And that's all I was trying to do. So I always talk to all NGOs, and I love the young people there with so much passion and uh, you know, doing that work for a, you know, pennies on the dollar. I thought it was just amazing what they were doing. Just, uh, I'm also very fascinated by how leaders take charge. And Sion, I want to ask you, you became president of Dartmouth on June 12th. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what, and unlike Indra, you are an, out, you are an outsider. Uh, Indra was an insider when she became CEO of PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. What did you do 100 days before you took over as president? And what have you done? It's about 100 days since you've been on the job. What have you done in the last 100 days to really take charge? I mean, for me, it's about getting to know a culture and an institution, especially coming in from outside. And that's about asking questions about 
talking to alums, faculty, students, staff, what makes Dartmouth special, what's, what's great, and also where the pain points are. Mm -hmm. So basically what I did is ask everyone the same questions. Um, we also did some research to understand what people in the US thought about Dartmouth and thought about higher ed in general. Um, and then it was a lot of talking and asking questions. I've sat down now, I think, with over 250 faculty one-on-one. -on -one. VG, we had one of these meetings on Zoom. Really, I wanted to know about faculty's research, um, what's great and where the problems are, where we can be better, where the opportunities are. And I think when you come into a place and you're really blind, you don't understand a culture or an institution, you only know what you've read, the only way to do it is to ask everyone the same questions. And that's how you start building your own mental model. And of course, it was also about thinking about the team around me and how to build a team around me that would push at my mental model, that would push at my assumptions, that would challenge them. Um, and, and it's been a lot of listening and learning and question asking. And that's how I've gotten to know Dartmouth and how I continue to get to know it. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to ask two more questions and then open it up for the audience. There are two mics. There's one on that side, one here. Uh, when I say, this is my last question, if you can line up and you can engage with both Indra and, and Sion. Let me get to the second theme, which is really innovation. Mm -hmm. And Indra, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, technology is impacting business in some very profound ways. And you are on the board of Amazon, so you're a front row seat to how technology is disrupting so many industries. Tell me the intersection of technology and business what kinds of big innovation opportunities it's opening up for us? Hmm. I mean, I tell you, the funny thing is, six or nine months ago, this whole area of generative AI, nobody talked about it. Large language models was never in anybody's uh, you know, uh, consciousness. And all of a sudden, that's all we're talking about right now. So I think technology is coming at us from all kinds of directions. And we haven't even seen what it really can do. Um, I was playing with GPT 3.5. I play with that and I go, oh, GPT is going to be five years away because GPT 3.5 is very primitive. But I'm unwilling to pay the $20 for GPT 4 because I don't want it to be too much more advanced. So it's the fear of the unknown <laughs> that's preventing me from paying the $20 subscription. But I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, everything you hear about quantum computing, you hear about various aspects of technology, things are going to proceed at some rapid clip. Um, people talk about hundreds of thousands of do jobs going away. I don't think it's going to happen as fast as people say it's going to go away. They even talked about uh, colleges being recast and what's going to happen to the future of college cities. I don't think that's going to happen to at the pace at which people are talking about. I think what we have today is a lot of technologies to help you do your job better. I don't think it's a substitute for humans. It's more a wonderful way to augment what humans are doing. That's the way I look at all the generative AI stuff. At some point, it may be as good as humans. I don't know when that's going to be. It's up to us how we train it. But uh, the way we teach all this cannot ignore those technologies. The worst thing we can do is continue teaching the way we used to teach and ignore that this technological change is happening around us. We have to now start to figure out how to teach people how to interact with technology. For example, how do you teach law and say, the paralegal may not exist in a couple of years? And then what's the entry point for a young law student? Um, in companies, you don't need scores of people reading contracts, writing contracts. Generative AI can do that all for you. Then what's the value added of a lawyer? So almost in law school, you're going to have to play out all these scenarios. So not only do we have to train our students differently, we almost have to have the t professors go back to school because now everybody has to learn these new skills. And so I look at this as a exciting future ahead of us, but for those who don't go back to school in a way, it's going to be a scary future because either you're going to be teaching the wrong, skill, the wrong skills or you're going to be ill-prepared for the future. One of the two. Yeah. Let me ask you the same question on innovation to you, Sion. In an institution like, academic institution like Dartmouth, what do you see are the innovation opportunities in what we teach and how we teach? 
Yeah, I mean, I think just going back to, to Indra's comments, I mean, I see us as collaborating with the technology. That's, that's how we should think mm -hmm. about it, is how we collaborate. And, and God, I think it underscores the importance of a Dartmouth education, where we're teaching students how to think, not what to think, the questions to ask, whether it's at the business school or the medical school or engineering or our undergrads, this is the kind of education that one needs to think about how they move into the future. It also means having supporting faculty to teach with this technology. So we're thinking a lot about that. We have a new committee focused on that to help faculty think about how they teach with the technology mm. and, and how it evolves together. Um, and it, I think it means using the technology in really interesting ways. So we're using it a lot in our healthcare and Geisel for how people can have access to medical opportunities when they're not physically at a hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's just so many exciting opportunities. And to me, I'm not scared. Maybe maybe I should be, but I'm not scared. I'm excited. And I'm excited because I think it underscores what's so special about a Dartmouth education. I think both of you, what you're saying is so important that the technology will augment exactly. what we do uh, at Dartmouth and make us give even more education. Uh, then it's possible, and that's the way to kind of frame it and think about it. You know, Vijay, you can almost say when we think about college and graduate school, we say you learn all the hard skills in college, and then at, in life you pick up the soft skills. One of the things I learned in COVID is the opposite. With the internet, you can pick up all the hard skills online, but you need to come to college for the soft skills. Yeah. You almost grow in college, and you, you need the college yeah. environment to interact with people, learn how to work in teams, and in business school, you definitely learn that. Yeah. So there's huge value to a college university education. And we should not understate it because people talk about the new kind of education system where, where everything is online. I don't think we're doing humanity right by do, thinking that way. I totally agree, and I think if COVID taught us anything, everyone wanted to come back to their residential experience. The students, Absolutely. and more important, the parents wanted them to go back. That's for sure. Everyone wanted them to go yeah. back. Mm. Um, but it is, it's, it's, how to, it's learning how to interact with others, learning how to have viewpoints and discussions that are exactly. different from your own, learning what you're, you like and what you don't like, learning how to fail, how to be uncomfortable. I just did matriculation, which is an amazing Dartmouth tradition where the president shakes every first year mm. student, undergrad student's hand last Sunday. Um, and I talked to them about, this is all about getting ready to be uncomfortable, to learning mm. how to be uncomfortable, to put, that's how you push yourself and it's learning about how to get the supports around you um, and getting used to the idea that that's how you grow, by experiencing new things, new yeah. people, new ways of being. And I think the residential experience is such an important part okay. of it. Yeah. In, fa in fact, the COVID, if it taught us anything, it taught us our model is so important. No the question intensive, about it. immersive residential experience and its importance. I'm going to ask one more question. And if you could just line up behind the mic, you can ask questions to them. And just on the last theme, impact. Uh, Indra, I want to start with you. Uh, I know you are a very big believer in sustainability. Mm. And business, when it follows sustainability, there is some conflict with profitability also. And talk to us about the role of business in addressing global challenges like climate change and others. The problem is that if you think about sustainability as sort of a social responsibility program, um, decoupled from the business, it leads to all the critics saying it's woke. Whatever woke means, I still don't know what woke is, but <laughs> I'm just going to use that word because it's nice to show I'm cool. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is because climate change is for real, water distress is for real, too much plastics in the environment is for real, Health and wellness issues is for real. All of these are for real. We have two choices. We can say companies which are engines of efficiency do not have to address it. But just keep doing what you're doing and let governments address the issues. Governments don't have the money, so they turn around and either tax the companies or worse still, take away a license to operate. So I'll give you a simple example, water use. I grew up in a city like you did, Viji, where there was no water. Summertime, drought. No water to eat or drink or whatever. Tankers had to come from faraway places and you had to pay for it. On the outskirts of the city is a beverage plant using two and a half liters of water to make a liter of the beverage. And every time 
their pumps couldn't extract water. They had high pressure pumps that went in deeper into the aquifer. Now look at this equation. So that company can draw as much water as it can while the town does not have any water. Now one of the sustainability planks we had was reduce water usage in our factories. We did it not because we wanted to help towns. If we did not address this issue, pretty soon we would get thrown out or shut down by that city. Or worse still, they will start charging us an arm and a leg for water. So we linked sustainability initiatives to shareholder value and said, we have to work on technologies to reduce water usage because we, would, we need a license to operate. And if we didn't do this, then we wouldn't have the license to operate. Or worse still, the cost would go up. So it was it's not about, it's a nice to do. It's a corporate social responsibility. It's this is how you make money, a new way. Change the way you make money. So every sustainability initiative that you embark on, first pick which ones you want to focus on and make sure it's also shareholder value creating. Don't make it a separate department that's just reporting on the metrics. If you do that, you lose the impact of um, metric, of sustainability. And, and that also goes to the innovation because what you're saying is we've got to innovate our strategy itself so totally. that we, it, it contributes to sustainability and to profits. Social totally. value and, and economic value go together. Totally. I mean, the example I'll give you is when certain company dumped uh, its effluent stream into the Hudson decades ago. Uh, if you now go back to the papers, they knew it was a toxic stream which went into the Hudson. Many, many decades later, when all the fishes started to die and things started to happen, they made the company clean it up. That was a lot of money spent by the company many years later. The question is, who's going to pay the costs to society which incurred issues? And the CEO had to pay out the big bucks, was the villain, while the CEO who dumped the effluent stream was the hero. How do you think about this whole ecosystem as a, a way to think about shareholder value creation in a different way? And I think that's the challenge, Vijay. I'll throw this challenge to you all in academia because you will frame it in a better way than we do. We could use some help here. But, no, but I, th yeah. I think you said it very well. We need to change the way companies make money so that economic value and social value go together. Exactly right. Hand. Today they don't. They don't. And I think that, that's a yeah. good one. And I was just going to add that I th humans, we want to make things uh, mutually exclusive, right? It's easier to deal with a dichotomy. It's either this or that. It's just easier for our brains mm -hmm. to deal with. I think the challenge is to, to talk about that differently, thinking about how we think about diversifying our student body or our faculty or staff is a great example of that. Is it, are we doing the best work versus thinking about diversity? No, you cannot have the best outcomes unless you have voices at the table whose opinions are not always centered, unless you can push at each other. Right. So it's not about the best talent or the best outcomes versus diversity and inclusion. It's that you need a diverse group at the table who feel like they belong to get the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's pushing people to get away from the cognitively easy either or right. and to see the link in a different way. Absolutely. It, it, floor is open. If you want to pose a question, please go to the mic. Yeah, please. Sian, Indra, and BG, thank you so much for this incredibly enlightening and enjoying a talk. Um, my name is Anna East. I am a senior at Dartmouth College, um, and I have a question for Indra. So I know that you have spoken previously about your five C's of leadership on um, courage, on confidence, consistency, commitment, um, and compass. And um, I'm just really curious to hear about how at your time at Pepsi, your leadership philosophy has evolved as you've worn different hats and also how maybe at different stages of your career there were certain tenets that you leaned into more deeply than others. You know, those five C's expanded to seven and I changed some of the C's. That's a beauty, you know, as things change, you know, you add. <laughs> if I, uh, but what I really... Uh, uh, have been doing is dig deeper into the C. So, for example, the first C is competence. Uh, people talk about competence, which means I have to be a good accountant or a good sustainability person or a good lawyer. I'm now saying it's a little different. As you guys leave Dartmouth, whether the Tuck School or undergraduate, you have to ask yourself, not just am I competent at doing something, what is my proposition? When somebody in the company looks at me, 
Will they say, Annie is very good at this. She's really good at this, but if she's not here, you can't have a meeting. Because when you do that, you become almost uh, an important player on the team as opposed to just another player on the team. So every one of you has got to think about not just, sheer, just plain competence, but your proposition. It's moving beyond competence to your proposition. And so some of these elements of the Cs, I've been going deeper to say, how do you develop a proposition? How do you get people bought into that? So that's my new uh, assignment. Thank you. How about that side? Hi, uh, my name is Manis Vini, um, and I'm a master's student at uh, Geisel. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you guys for fostering such an awesome environment in America for women to feel comfortable in stepping up to these leadership positions. I think it's really um, great to hear from you all. But um, so Dr. Govindarajan mentioned that you were an insider when you stepped up um, at PepsiCo, right? But it's fair to say that you entered corporate America as somewhat of an outsider when Asian Americans and further Hindus were few and far between. Mm. Could you speak to how your culture and faith shaped your career in leadership and how you balanced a level of assimilation into American culture while still maintaining your own cultural values? It's a great question. I think that, you know, I was so different when I came into the Yale School of Management and then as I went into every job, there was literally nobody like me in corporate America. But when I was at Yale, um, we must have had about 20 kids in a class of 110 who were international students. Um, we all hung out together. All of us non-European and um, American kids hung out together because nobody knew how to assimilate us into the rest of the class. We dressed weird, we smelled weird, <laughs> we looked weird, we talked weird, everything was weird. I say weird in quotes. Today it can be mainstream, but those days nobody had seen somebody like us, right? And God, we dressed really well because we didn't have money to buy good clothes. And nobody taught us how to dress. So we all hung out together all the time. By the time the second year rolled by, people started to realize maybe these kids are smart, so we need them on our teams. So all of a sudden we were assimilated into all the teams, which made a difference, okay? Little by little by little, remember I was talking about your proposition, we had to earn our right to be in the mainstream. We were always on the fringe. And that went for a long time. Even when I was at BCG, I was in Chicago. Um, my clients were all in Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. They hadn't seen somebody like me coming to the boardrooms and telling CEOs what to do. So even there, I had to perform way better than the others. Now, one of the things I decided was I didn't want two personas, one who I am and one what I wanted to be viewed as at work. I was just myself. So uh, I'm a lifelong vegetarian. Remember, I was in the Midwest. They didn't know what vegetarianism was at that time. <laughs> now it's better. Those days in the 80s, nobody knew what vegetarianism was. They would give me mashed potato and green peas. And they would literally take the steak off the plate in front of me <laughs> and say, here's your vegetarian plate. Which, you know, in retrospect, you want to laugh about it. But, you know, what is vegetarianism? Okay, it's an alien concept. So. Uh, I, I'm still a vegetarian, I don't smoke, I don't drink, so I was never a social um, assimilator. I stayed on the outside, but I was comfortable with that because that was who I was. So I remained a vegetarian and I tell people, accept me for who I am. If you don't include me in your social events, it's okay. I'm going home because I've got kids and a husband. So I went home. I was not included in social events. So again, the reason I could live with that is because I had a proposition. What I tell people is you can do all your weekends in the Cayman Islands and in Montana, you can do whatever you want, but don't you dare talk about business because if you come back and then hand me an assignment, I'm not doing it. So there was a proposition that was clear and that if Indra is not included in that discussion, we will not get a good output. So let's not piss her off, therefore, <laughs> let's not discuss business when we're fishing and horseback riding and eating a barbecue because she won't do it. And we don't want her anyway. She'll be the only woman, which is good. And I was happy with my babies and my husband at home. So it worked out for both of us. It requires an enormous amount of self-confidence to go through this. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm Thank also... <laughs> Let's have a question from this side. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nui, President Baylock, and Professor Govindrajan for blessing us with your presence today. I'm Gagan. I'm a second year Tuck student. Um, and 
my question is about uh, developing leadership and one thing I feel successful leaders develop over time is the ability to make more good decisions than bad ones and make them quickly. Do you have some uh, sort of advice for students like us to develop that quality uh, as we get into the business world or whatever world we are entering right? Yeah, I mean, I would just say one thing, it's not just about you being a leader by yourself. You're putting a good team around you so that the decision that you eventually own is being made with lots and lots of input. And I think one thing it takes is courage to, to be okay with being wrong, to make a decision that's decisive that not everyone is going to like or that you don't know if it will succeed. Um, but for me, it's that courage to be able to put it out there and say, okay, this is where we're going. And it is fueled by having lots of people arguing and, and having different opinions and feeling like they can push at each other. And you're not going to get them all right, but once you have hashed out a lot of what could go wrong ahead of time, it's much easier to pull the trigger. Let's have one from this side. I've got this question for Sian. For Sian. Um, I'm Jeff DeMurray. I'm class of 80 from Dartmouth. Parent of the 20, so I've been around Dartmouth for a while. A lot of, seen a lot of different things. Um, my question to you is, you talked earlier about your first 100 days of listening and asking good questions, but a person's reputation generally is made on, um, it generally is made by actually, actually, actually making a decision on something. And so what, what, do you, what do you expect to be your first type of decision that you're going to come up to that's required you to go beyond just asking questions? But, I should just sign something, sign something that may not be popular. Yeah, well, in addition to asking questions, we've also been doing lots of actions. Um, one area that we're really focusing is, for example, centering health and well-being across the institution. Um, I'm really excited. Next week, we're going to have all living surgeons general on campus <laughs> to talk about well-being. And we're making decisions in terms of centering it on campus, in terms of putting a chief well-being officer on my senior team, in terms of rolling out policies that support students, faculty, and staff. And so in the midst of listening, there's also a lot of doing. Um, and I think you have to do both at the same time. Terrific. Good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Atharva Tendulkar. Uh, I just had three quick comments. The first one was, uh, you know, what you mentioned about undergrad. So I had one professor during my undergrad back in India who said, that your hard work doesn't end at the end of four years, your mm -hmm. hard work begins at the end yep. of four years. Uh, the second quick point was regarding AI, like you mentioned. Uh, there was a wonderful quote which said, AI is not going to replace you, the people using AI will. <laughs> and uh, the third point is, uh, you know, to Indra, uh, can I take this opportunity to hand over my book to you, which I've written? <laughs> because, oh, certainly. Yes, because uh, I thought that, you know, if consulting or product management doesn't work, maybe poetry will work to convince people to move towards <laughs> sustainability. <laughs> Definitely, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Hi. I'm uh, Pete Yaksik. I'm one of Manus's classmates in the uh, MPH program at Geisel. Um, uh, Two-fold question. One, I'm really uh, <laughs> concerned about this divisive smog that is permeating this country, this attitudinal polarization, confirmation bias, you know, being torn, pulled to these extremes of right-wing, left-wing, conservative, liberal, Democrat, uh, Republican. And we're not finding a movement towards finding common ground. Uh, it's, it's a zero-sum game. For me to win, you must lose. And for both of you, how do you protect that type of divisiveness from seeping into your organization without allowing your employees uh, to have ownership of their cognitive uh, belief system? And uh, secondly, just that I find this really adds to this concept of chronic toxic stress for certain segments of our population where um, especially those folks living in impoverished, distressed communities suffering from the omnipresent stressors of erratic nutrition, uh, transient housing, overcrowded population, or overcrowded housing, um, low self-worth. Uh, so I'm asking within your organizations, 
how do you try to manage this the best you can, and then within the communities that you're serving, which often uh, include people uh, living uh, in distress. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Look, I think universities should be leaders in having difficult conversations and dialogues across difference, and it doesn't come for free. We have to teach it. We have to talk about creating brave spaces where you can feel uncomfortable with different opinions, where people are not self-censoring. It's something I'm very passionate about, and it's something that I think Dartmouth can really lead on. Our students are interested in doing this. We have the Dartmouth Political Union that really works to bring in speakers across political viewpoints. Our faculty are interested in doing this in terms of teaching difficult topics on campus. And um, I'm excited on Friday during my inauguration speech to talk about how I think we're gonna lead in this area. It's a combination of supporting students, faculty, our staff in and outside the classroom so that we can have the kinds of conversations that lead to better outcomes. One of the criteria that psychologists talk about for having difficult conversations, for being uncomfortable, for challenging each other is a sense of community and trust and belonging. And I've never seen a community like Dartmouth that offers that opportunity. I think we can be a model for how to do this for universities, for colleges, for the country, for the world. And certainly we're preparing the leaders to go out and, and be in positions that allow them to have those conversations. And I think Dartmouth can do a big part there. And I did co-publish on attitudinal polarization at a college in New York City in a building or across the street from where you came <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I tell you, the, the thing, the big difference between um, universities and companies is that we have one mission. You know, we have to deliver an earnings per share, we have to deliver a goal. The whole company is working towards this one mission. And there's no way you'll deliver on these goals unless you come to work and park your uh, you know, sort of divisive opinions at the door. Because if you came in and all that you're focused on is the, the differences as opposed to what unites us, we'll never be able to deliver on the goal. So I'd say goal um, commonality is very, very important. Uh, and I'd say that, you know, politics should also have a goal commonality that's focused on the citizens as a whole. Uh, however, I will tell you that as I look at any issue in the company, one third are for it, one third are against it, and one third don't have a point of view. So you can say two thirds are for it or two thirds are against it, depending on how you want to read the tea leaves. So even when we have goal clarity and goal unity, we still have under the covers, we have the simmering differences of uh, differing points of view. The challenge is you have all of those uh, points of view at home, don't bring it to the workplace because it's literally like a separation of church and state. We have to all deliver on our numbers. Do not bring your deep differences to the workplace. And by and large, companies are successful doing that, by and large. One last question here from the audience, yeah. Oops. Okay, uh, so I have a question for you, Mrs. Nui. Uh, you attribute a lot of your success uh, to the incredible mentors along the way and have often talked about how an entire ecosystem uh, work towards that. Um, I don't think you always got lucky. So uh, can you share how we can find the right mentors going forward and how should we think about like building our own ecosystem that could push us forward? Mentors find you, you don't find them. If you went to somebody and say, will you be my mentor, what can they do, to, do for you? Seriously. Because a real mentor who can have an impact on your life has got to be in an ecosystem where they can influence the ecosystem to your benefit. If Gerhard Schulmeier was my mentor, I call him a mentor, he calls himself my boss. I'll give you an example, he called once when I had a temporary secretary. <coughs> And he's used to calling and saying, Schulmeier, and the secretary would you know, jump and salute and give me the phone. But he called that day and he goes, Schulmeier, and the secretary goes, can you spell your name? And he starts SC, then he goes, stops and he goes, B-O-S-S, -S, just tell her, okay? <laughs> so he was that kind of a guy, all right? He viewed himself as my boss. I viewed him as a mentor because he was great at giving me feedback. He gave me stretch assignments. Um, he built me up and he could influence the trajectory of my career. That's a real mentor. 
If I'd gone to some other company, person in the company and said, will you be my mentor? Yeah, they might have given me advice now and then, but they can't do anything else. And so, contrary to what people believe, mentors pick you because they see something in you that gives them hope that if they were to push you, they too would look good. Because they can look back one day and say, I had a say in her success. I can't tell you how many people wrote to me when I became CEO and say, do you remember in 19XX, I helped you, uh, you know, solve these things? <laughs> I told my people in Florida that I was a mentor of yours. And I write back saying, absolutely. You made a huge difference in my life. <laughs> All right? So two-way street. The one thing I will tell you, if mentors pick you, please take their advice. Or if you're not going to take their advice, go tell them why you didn't take it. Very often, your mentors come to you and say, don't do this, it's not a good idea. Then you do it, and then you fail. And then what's the mentor supposed to do? So if you cho choose not to follow their advice, go to them and say, let me tell you why I'm not taking your advice. Include them in your decision-making process. Okay? It's a two-way street. Terrific. Thank you so much. They say time flies by when you're having fun. It's such a wonderful conversation. We're almost coming to the end. Maybe, Sion, let me ask one last question to you. Uh, imagine the year is 2040, <laughs> and you are retiring from Dartmouth as the president. <laughs> and New York Times is going to write a story about your tenure. What do you want that story to, to say? 2040 or 50? Yeah, yeah which young. year did you say? <laughs> <laughs> 2050, sorry, you're right. <laughs> 2050 is more like, yeah. You know, it's, it's a really interesting question and one that I'm still actually forming an answer to as I learn more about the community, so I don't have it all worked out. But if I had to say one thing, I want folks to know that Dartmouth is an engine of impact. It's a place where discoveries go to impact and we better the human condition. And I would like to be known as a president that helped make that clear, helped speed up the process, and um, really built the leaders of tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> Sian, why don't I ask you to tie a ribbon around yes. today's evening with some final thoughts? Well, thank you all for being here and Indra for being here. Um, it's just a great way to connect, kick off my inauguration by having someone that I know we admire who's broken barriers um, in so many ways, um, but also continues to learn and continues to mm -hmm. teach others what you're learning in terms of leadership. I think that's one of the best things about a university ecosystem is that we're always learning. That's what excites me every day when I learn something new and we can push boundaries, and I think you're a great example of that. We have a gift to give you. Oh, um, thank you. Yes. But thank you, Viji. Yes, mean, and I think you, you are Viji. amazing. It's just amazing <laughs> to be here with you. Yeah, this is um, from Dartmouth. It's bookends engraved with the lone pine, the Dartmouth symbol. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. And, thank uh, you all. And, Appreciate and it. Thank, thank you for Viji. being here. Pleasure. And thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, Viji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see everyone tomorrow and Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Take out the mic.